morning, shining diamonds. Uh, okay, um, so. Natalie here, and I'm so stoked. Love this summertime, love coming back alive. So good to see you and connect face to face. Um, so, um, we are just uh, rounding out an awesome U.S. tour. We were able to hit a few spots on the way. We're going to hit different spots every time we, we do that tour, but it was amazing. Just in Atlanta a couple nights ago, had a great event, and just love the Inspire events and the connecting with people. Um, it's really been a testament to us of what we talked about on the presidential trip with the – how's the audio? Thumbs up? Um, what we talked about on the presidential trip with the executives of getting back to our stories, um, sharing our oil stories and sharing our success stories, right? Getting back to that, getting back to the connection. And at these events, we typically just took question and answer after sharing our story. And they were just all so powerful. So remember in your teams, um, the power of just doing those simple um, inspire pieces that way. Um, you can do it, um, you know, it could just even be a few couples that you take out to dinner when you are passing through an area where you have team. Invite those husbands, let's get it going, right? So that um, they can have their questions answered about the business, about the opportunity, um, and can support those women or whatever it is that they need to take it to the next level. So we got some awesome awesomeness happening. Um, Want to do some quick recognition for a couple new shiny diamonds. Um, Jennifer Inchiostro, awesome accomplishment, diamond, and Natalie Blackburn. So happy to have you join us here in our Diamond Mastermind. We love what's created here. And some people catch it live. A lot of people catch the recording. It just keeps us connected um, as a leadership team so we can take things up a notch. Um, we want to let you know a few other announcements as well. So we've got, um, we've got the Diamond... Uh, the incentive trip coming up in January. We are putting together an amazing Diamond Mastermind hook to that trip. Um, the incentive trip is a little bit longer this time. And so we are actually going to do uh, some of our specialty diamond um, pieces that we do along with the trip and that event. So we may stay over one night. We're just exploring that, but it should be almost the same timeline as doTERRA's trip. And we're just going to combine and keep it super simple. But we want to give you um, some incentives for hitting diamond um, twice between now and uh, November. Uh, you qualify for those incentives and we're just finalizing exactly what those look like. So um, we'll be having a a fun uh, little lunch connection where we can announce that either on Tuesday or Wednesday of convention or we'll announce it um, at our next call. Uh, just also wanted to um, let you know about that Tuesday training pre-convention. We'd love to help have um, any help from those of you that want to participate, those of you that want to facilitate, um, we're going to do um, mentoring up in the upper ranks, and we'd love to bring you into those pieces and events. If you pop me, um, actually, we'll just do it on the Facebook page. So I'll have Andy post, um, just hey, who wants to help um, lead mentoring circles? there on that Tuesday pre-convention training. It's gonna be awesome. We have, um, we're, we're so synced up now. Um, this last presidential trip was really uh, an amazing new synergy came to be. So we are all synced up. Um, Brianne Hovey, Kyle Kirschbaum, Jessica Moultrie, um, Brianne Hovey, 
uh, us, Laura, Vibes, we're all synced up. We're bringing things together at this point. Elise and all of her team, and we're bringing the clarity that launch has given to so many of us and helped with advancements this year. And there'll be specific direction. Um, and then we'll go over a lot of launch and the power of launch in the main um, main general session. And then we'll break into breakouts um, a few hours in so that those are just train by rank breakouts. So your people are receiving exactly what they need for uh, the perfect place that they're at, right? The development stage that they're in in doTERRA. So couldn't be more excited about that and about the way that that's all coming together. Excited to be a part of you there. Again, um, make a comment on the Facebook page. Any questions there? Um, now's your chance to get live answers. Anybody have any questions? Sweet. Let's roll. Um, we have an awesome guest speaker today. And I want to introduce you to, um, first of all, I'm going to introduce you to um, Lyle Swim. He is um, helping transform our world in so many ways. He's a change agent, and he has brought his many gifts to uh, doTERRA and what we are about um, in our lives and supported us in that process. And Lyle, maybe, maybe you could come over and, and show your face, and, and then we could uh, bring, bring Brian in. Hey, everybody. How are you? <laughs> Thanks uh, for joining us informally. Yeah, I'm glad I could be here. And Glad to have Natalie and Andy back. I'm sure they had a great trip, but um, glad to have them back too. So yeah, I'm really excited to, to be a part of this. Um, you know, kind of my pre-life before that and doing leadership development and helping young companies take that next big step into the unknown. And so um, I'm excited to have it be, you know, in a situation where not only is um, I being able to do stuff that I enjoy and love and feel really good at, but I'm also able to do it for an organization that is having such a powerful impact on millions of people's lives for good. So it's kind of a best of both worlds bringing those two together. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to meeting more of you um, at convention during that week, uh, during that Tuesday pre-convention and hearing from you and um, learning more ways that as an organization, you know, at Andy and Natalie's level, that as we build an organization to support them, we're also doing it to keep you in mind and how we better support you and provide you the kind of support and, and help that allows you to, to reach your goals and desires and purpose uh, in what you're doing with the Terra. So awesome. I'm excited to be with mm, Thank you, Lyle. It gives us a lot of peace <laughs> to know that Lyle is here and, and he is just watching out for what's going to serve you and helping us with, you know, you know all about this, right? We get called into this doTERRA space, and here we are trying to serve big, play big, and yet um, we've had great experiences to prepare us for doTERRA, but it's just literally not every experience, right? So Lyle really brings so much to the table of things that we wish we knew, that we wish we had great expertise in, and he comes equipped with all of that. So we're so grateful to have that here at the table and make a difference for us and for you. Um, because well, you, you, are, you probably already know my better half. Several of you uh, as Jenny Swim. So we're, we're she's awesome. She's awesome, and, and uh, so she the, the Goddards didn't know that when they signed her on board, eventually they were going to get the whole package for better or for worse. But um, so uh, even as a couple, we're really excited for for what this means, and, and we're all in now, right? From from me to her mm -hmm. in every way, we're kind of all in. Okay, so awesome. So, we, yeah, I, so our special, <laughs> our special guest today, I'm going to turn you off and then I'll assume that I can do it. Okay. Our special guest today, um, <laughs> 
we have asked him some tough questions and um, he's had some good answers and that's why he's here. We, we really take seriously what we're doing. You know, we just got back from this 30 day road trip where we really tried to help our family and integrate our family into our business, right? More and more. So, I mean, whether it was the very first things we were talking about, like let's have the kids do a little magic show at the beginning of the event because they were excited about that, or having them prep folders so we could give them to people there, um, just connecting them with other people um, at the event. All of those things were, were super powerful for us, and we feel more united now as a family than we've ever been before in this business, right? It was, it's been fun to share with every Uber driver that's been hauling us around as we leave our RV at the campground and Uber around here and there. Um, we've been able to share doTERRA and the kids have been able to watch that process happen and be like, we really have to help that guy. He really needs this. And he loves the oils. Did you see that? You know, and it's been so fun to watch um, that happen. And watch the miracle of them really integrating and coming into play with this business uh, come alive and go to a new level. And I, I've seen people do family and doTERRA in a lot of different ways. I've seen people sign up their kids and um, then enroll all the people under them and just have their kids be getting a big fat check and their kids being enabled in that process. And I've seen people um, be very empowered through doTERRA. And um, one of the things, you know, Max has about a year before he's 18 and we can sign him up. And I think, okay, how do we navigate this? How do we navigate this family business and how do we do it well? And how do we navigate um, this and keep them empowered? How do we pass on a legacy um, of, empowerment that really is what we're about in doTERRA how can we pass that on um, to these people here we're having just a little issue with the audio here so okay. let me Give it just a little bit muffled. Okay, can I? That's can you raise your hand if you, can, if you can hear me? I'm ready to go. Hang on just one minute, and I'll keep keep going on. Can I want to tell me? you, we can hear you, Gib. But we're going to have you connect a different way. Um, yeah. Um, okay, so we're back. Let me tell you just a couple things about my recent trip. I just got back from Hong Kong from China Convention. Let me tell you a little bit about that till we get Gib on. Okay, and he's an he's an expert. I'm so excited to learn how to take our families to the next level with him and our business. Um, so really, um, China Convention was amazing. Um, it blew my mind. I tell you, I think that I know where doTERRA is going and how it's growing until I get in situations like that and I was just absolutely moved. Um, I could not believe how much, uh, how much growth there already is in such a short amount of time that it was, it was literally like 10 minutes of silvers walking across the stage being recognized. It's crazy, right? And as I'm watching that happen and then the golds, five minutes of golds and, you know, five minutes of platinums, this is before even the convention, I mean the gala, right, where they're recognizing all the diamonds. Just kids being. So um, as I was there, 
seeing that happen, I was so overcome with, wow, this vision is so much bigger than we ever imagined it. I remember um, hearing my sister, she worked for New Skin at a time, for a time, and she would talk about just busloads of people coming in for New Skin convention, and I, I, and that most of those were from China. And all of a sudden I thought, oh my goodness, like imagine convention as big as it is in the US in China. So incredible growth um, already happening, incredible growth potential. And um, just feel the stewardship. What you're about right now, what you're sharing right now is huge. It's impacting the world. It's rippling out. And um, the culture that we create and the leadership that we exhibit, it's going to have worldwide impact. And I think I really felt it on a whole new level um, at this China convention. It was amazing. It was also fun to share non-compliantly and that was pretty good stuff, right? Um, so any, I, I love this uh, shirt. Um, I saw, I caught somebody, there was this girl in the bathroom. She had a shirt that was an oil in every home, right? Um, and everything about that trip just took me back to this original vision of a healer in every home and what it means to have somebody empowered to use the gifts of the earth in every home. It changes spaces. It changes homes. It changes communities. It changes um, countries and it changes the earth. And um, somehow watching these people that were totally, you know, different cultures yet watching that they are so, they're entrenched in doTERRA. They love doTERRA. I'm watching these Chinese um, doctors get up and say all the ways that they're coaching their patients on how to use the oils. And it's working and it's happening and it was so well received. Um, so wherever you have, um, if those contacts that are Chinese contacts that you have are here in the U.S. or anywhere, just don't feel limited by that. Um, that market will grow and will rival or surpass the size of the U.S. market. I'm confident in that. And so feel free to share and be a part of that. It's so miraculous. I don't speak a word. The only thing I know how to say is shushu, which means thank you, right, Mandarin? But that's enough, and we connect as a people. It's amazing. Um, so I invite you to do that. Any questions on the China market? Or any questions about that? Nice. You guys are so up to speed. Um, there's a little, uh, things are getting easier and easier over there in the China market. So um, if you ever need it and you don't have it, just ask on Facebook and we'll, we'll share a little uh, webinar that was done on how to do business in the China market. But it's becoming easy and they're opening more, um, more stores everywhere. Okay, Tara, um, Singapore is a great country. Um, we have a gold leader there. Her name's... Uh, Li Ling Yit. I'll type it in. Um, and yes, there are leaders all around Singapore. I believe there's still some Singaporean founders positions if she stays on that. Um, I think they just have, you know, a handful of people qualified for founders. Um, Singapore is a great market. They have uh, a store right there, storefront, an office, and they're developing well. It's been a steady growth market. Um, love it with all that English. Um, right next door is Malaysia. And Malaysia will be opening in the next month or two. And that, um, that opening up in Malaysia is going to be amazing. That's where Greg Cook 
he opened up for New Skin before, and that market is growing really fast. There were some people from Malaysia at the um, China convention, and they are very business oriented yet health oriented. So there'll be a lot of fast growth in Malaysia. So being a part of that is great too. And for now, um, people take the product across from Singapore to Malaysia for now or have it forwarded through a mail forwarding service. But both of those markets are great, great markets. Um, Hong Kong has grown quite a bit as a market itself. It's doing well as well. Hey, hi, Natalie, can I ask a question? It's Jada. Please. Um, Thank you. Hi. <laughs> so um, just to be clear, that they're, they're still only allowed to go through the stores, right? So how exactly are they? Because I have two people that had originally signed up in New York, but they, um, they now moved back to Hong Kong. So they're living in Hong Kong, and that's where their entire community, one is an expat and another one is he's originally from Hong Kong so do they how do they actually build it when it's going through the store I'm a little unclear on that well it's actually even though there's a storefront and they can pick up there it operates the same as it does here in the US so um, for example a name if they have accounts that they started in the US they just need to call customer service and say hey I moved to Hong Kong shift my account to a Hong Kong account okay. um, so that they they'll have their products shipped from Hong Kong they just released a whole slew of new products in Hong Kong um, that have been approved so they have mostly everything now in Hong Kong and they oh. have it shipped from there okay. so amazing thank you awesome great it will be easy um, <laughs> So, it's a great market to build in. It's easy um, to build in comparatively, and it's really close to China. So, um, we have that. We have an expat diamond that just hit diamond month before last, and she did it all. Just you know, it's been a large amount of expat community. So you got a lot of good stuff set up there. Well, I want, Lyle knows <laughs> Dr. Gibb. I want him to introduce Dr. Gibb and then we'll roll into some questions there. Uh, so I met uh, uh, Dr. Dyer while I was at BYU doing my MBA. And uh, it wasn't actually one of the professors, but I got to know him um, and his background. He came in and guest lectured in a couple of our uh, classes and, and really enjoyed hearing from him. And then a few years ago, my father passed away early, unexpectedly, and we had a family foundation, and all of a sudden, we now had to transfer that, and how do you go through that, and, you know, do you do loyalty versus honesty, and as we were going through some of that transition, I actually reached out to Gib, and he came on and helped us with, through some things that we were wrestling with in a family transition of how do you transfer, in this case, a foundation, but the business to the next generation, and was really impactful for us at that point in time, and he shared some great stories. Ironically, he followed in his father's footsteps. His father was a great organization behavior professor at BYU. And Gibbs got some great stories of how his dad experimented on the kids with his organizational theory. I'm sure we've never experimented on our kids, right? <laughs> so um, with that, Gibb, I think, just a, has done tremendous research and just has a really great understanding, both personally because of what he went through and following his dad's footsteps, the family business being teaching and professorship. Um, to work with others, including groups like my family. And so uh, we've given him some initial questions to address, and he'll take maybe the next 20, 25 minutes to do that, and then uh, do some question and answer for you as you ponder and consider those issues as well. So give your up, and we look forward to hearing from you. Okay. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> I'm glad to be here today, and hopefully I can say a few things that will be helpful. Lyle said that he wanted me to talk about um, – issues related to succession and succession planning. And uh, that tends to be the area that I've done most of my consulting with in. Uh, I still remember the first guy that uh, after I did my PhD at MIT, I came to BYU and 
I had a, I wrote an article on family business and I had a fellow call me up and said, can I have lunch with you? I've got a issue with my family business. And I said, sure, be glad to go to lunch. So I went to lunch with him and, and he said, uh, well, my problem is that I've got a son who works with me and uh, he was doing something that I thought was unethical. So I fired him and my wife was so mad. She's kicked me out of the house and I'm now sleeping on a couch at my office. Can you help me? Wow. I said, uh, okay, that's a, <laughs> that's a tough problem. So the family businesses and the entrepreneurial firms I work with often have some serious issues and concerns and problems. So I'm going to go for about 20 minutes and cover the basic issues that I think are important for you to know about, and then I'll leave it open for question and answer. Okay. Yeah. All right. Can, yep. Can I ask you just to lay a little groundwork because um, many of us are just, you know, we're a little bit more developed. We've been here eight years. We've built um, more of a legacy to pass on, but a lot of these people are just trying to get their families involved and having it be a healthy thing to grow with before they okay. think about passing it on. So um, have you seen, maybe before we go to the passing it on, could you speak just a little bit to that? Of okay. The okay, that's a, <clears throat> yeah, that's a good issue. Um, <clears throat> key thing initially is, well, when you start a business, the problem is finding good people to work for you. And usually people aren't going to leave a good job to work in a startup unless it's, you know, really promising. So who are you going to get to work for you? It's usually your family or your friends. It's tough to find other people to, to work for you. But it often be, can become a serious problem because they don't have the skills that you really need to be successful. So initially, as you start your business, one, you need to be very clear about what your strategy is in the marketplace and be clear about what your competitive advantage is. So um, uh, it, uh, I've, I've done some consulting with uh, Culinary Crafts. They're a, a catering, catering business in the state of Utah. And Mary Crafts started with uh, her husband, and his, her husband was a baker, and that helped. So she got him involved and then got her two sons involved, and one of them is involved in the marketing and sales, and the other is involved in uh, uh, doing the events and, and the cooking. So the key thing that I find is that if you're going to bring family members or friends or anyone in, you've got to have a role that's very clear that will help you accomplish your mission and strategy and will help give you a competitive advantage. You don't just hire family members because they're family. That's usually the biggest mistake. They've got to bring a skill set to your company that you need. And if they don't have it, if, they, if you hire them and they're willing to gain it while they're working for you, that's fine. Preferably, they have the skill set before um, they go to work for you. And I know that they're, they may be family members, but I always find it helpful to have a job description for these people. Here's what you're supposed to do. It doesn't have to be, you know, overly detailed, but it needs to be really clear what it is you want them to do, and it needs to be really clear what their compensation is. So there's no question, okay, this is how you're going to be paid. Because too many times with family, it's easy to say, well, we'll sort of pay you this much, or here's kind of your job. But the more transparent you can be, clear about, here is the uh, opportunity, here's the job, et cetera. And if you're going to give them equity in your business, and I, don't, I generally don't like giving equity to family or others unless they're going to be significant long-term uh, contributors to your business. If they're not going to do that, you don't give them equity. Okay, that's just not what you want to do. But you want people who will join your business, 
who will certainly add value in the long term um, as well as well as the short term. So make sure again, if you hire family, you do it because it makes business sense, not because they're just family members. Because if if they come and then they don't contribute or can't contribute over the long term, then what do you do? Do you fire them? Do you, and that creates all kinds of issues and problems. Or if you give them equity and you have to then buy them out because you don't want them in your business, that creates all kinds of problems. So, so that's, I, love I what think, what I would say here. up front. Yeah, and I think the way that might apply, you know, in our business, too, is in as as you as diamonds think about setting up your children in spots in your organization um, make sure that they are creating value I love what you said about you know make sure it makes business sense they need to contribute in some way so make sure um, you're not enabling them by giving them that spot and filling everything in, but that they are contributing and you're finding ways to do that. Even if you do partner, right? If you want to partner, yeah. they shouldn't be taking on all the responsibilities, nor should you, but if you can come together and partner, then they can be building their account and their um, doTERRA spot um, as well. That's, yeah, that's part, yeah, for partners, you really want them to have hopefully a little different skill set than you have so that they can, you know, add something different to the business than you've done. And, you know, I've, I've had, I, I remember uh, listening to one fellow say, you know, I wanted my, my, my boys to be in the business with me. So I said, I, I went to him and I said, I need one of you to be an accountant. If you want to work for me, I need an accountant. Which one of you wants to be the accountant? Go to BYU and be the accountant. And one, kid said okay I'll be the accountant and he said another guy I need to do marketing you want to work with, for me you got I need someone to do marketing and one boy said okay I'll do marketing and another one uh, he said I need somebody to do uh, production for me are you willing to do that and he said yes yeah. so I mean that's a little heavy-handed I guess to say okay you want to work for me this is specifically what I need but it actually worked out really quite well for them because he knew what he needed and he then told his sons, you need to get the uh, training so that when you come and work for me, you'll have this uh, the ability to, to contribute to the business. So that's the main thing, I think, with and, and to provide them with opportunities then to get the knowledge and skills they need so that they can add value. Well, and I love what you're saying there is that we can right now with our children, we can invite them to be getting this preparation, right? Like, That's right. Whether they're 18 or not, or headed to college or not, these are these are things they can do. Whether they're doing it on Khan Academy or um, online courses or experiential internships, all these things can prepare them to be in a position where they're really adding value through their DoTerra um, business or DoTerra spot. There. That's right, and and to have, I mean, in in the culinary crafts case, and this doesn't apply to your folks but they uh, but they uh they had their kids start delivering uh you know orders and stuff uh, with their wagons when they were like eight years old and so i'm um, having them involved in the business or having them understand what it's like being involved in conversations those kinds of things are very very helpful and useful so that they when they get in they understand what the business is like and uh, um, so you know, maybe, that's, it, it is tough. Maybe as you're saying that, one way we could do that is really, you know, do what we can to get them involved right now in our, in our business, make it a family business. What are some ways, I mean, we, some of us have really young children and we have them fill, help us fill sample bottles or um, yep. help us you know, fill folders or prepare mailing shipments, little simple things like that. Um, any tips on doing that as a family so they, they start, you know, seeing that their contribution matters and they start building value that way? Absolutely. And they learn how to work, mm -hmm. uh, you know, have them 
take them on a tour of the doTERRA facilities. I mean, I've done some projects uh, in the past out there for, for, for doTERRA and I did a lot of work for years with new skin enterprises and uh, you know, having family see what the products are, see where they're made, see what the, uh, what it's all about. And uh, when I was, Working for New Skin, I I love to go to the conventions and see what was uh, going on there. Those were kind of fun to see uh, how they uh, re- rewarded people and got people excited. And you got to go to you know get up get sample products and all kinds of things like that. So yeah, get them get them involved early on and see what it's like. And even if they don't go into the business, they'll still learn about business and learn about uh, things that are important to be successful so that they could transfer that into, you know, whatever they eventually end up doing in terms of their work. You know, even if they decide to be a, a doctor or, you know, heaven forbid a lawyer or something like that. I shouldn't say that I've got a daughter who's a lawyer. So, but, but, the, but, but yeah, I think that's a, that's a great thing to do. Get them involved uh, early on, give them opportunities. I love what you're saying about help them see the big vision and put the pieces together. So maybe on some of your trips this summer, you stop in, let doTERRA, um, let that tour through doTERRA give our children a VIP tour instead of just giving all these other people a VIP tour. Let them see that and be a part of the magic and see how it all goes full circle, right? I think another way to do that, go ahead. No, absolutely. I I still remember I was on a panel with uh, Peter Huntsman, who's John Huntsman's uh, son, and uh, he said his initial uh, exposure to the business was that his dad would take him out on trips that would tour the different uh, uh, chemical plants, Mm -hmm. and that he would even give be given a chance not just to meet some of the people, but I guess John Huntsman would give a talk. And he, and even though Peter was just a teenager at the time, was fairly young, they would uh, he would let you know Peter say a few words to the people, and uh, and Peter uh, now is president of the company, but it was a good way for him to build uh, relationships with people in the company over time, and uh, for the for the employees to get to know him, and particularly if you're in network marketing you know, giving your children a chance to build social capital with key people out there who, um, you know, are in the, in the field and doing network marketing, I think is really, is really, really important. So uh, that's a, that's a good thing uh, to do. Get them involved early on. That's a great way to groom them, right? They're meeting those other key people. Um, One other thought, I had as you were speaking was that with our humanitarian trips where people are going out and experiencing, you know, parents with children, these uh, co-impact sourcing situations where doTERRA is sourcing the oils, that's another way to help bring these messages home so it becomes part of them. And then whether they are, you know, taking over, I guess we have a few scenarios, right? You're going to speak to that. whether they're taking over our legacy um, or they're starting their own, um, they can they can do that with being very equipped. Yeah, uh, I, there. and and yeah, and and the other thing, of course, related to that, I think the 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 hands-on training, having them go to, you know the various events and meeting people is critical. But I also do think that, and of course I teach at a university, but to encourage them to have some formal training as well, I think is important. So, uh, uh, so to encourage your kids to, you know, for example, at BYU, you don't have to necessarily major in business, but we have a business minor. So you could take a marketing class or a finance class and, uh, uh, and, or accounting class, and and it gives them a chance to get exposure from different people related to business. So, um, uh, or get an associate's degree. Uh, UVU's got a really good program there, and, and other places, Salt Lake Community College. 
So I would encourage also some exposure beyond yourself uh, and your your own family and your own organization. Get them some exposure to uh, others uh, outside. And typically it would be formal education. Uh, but I think there's some real value to that because then they get different ideas and issues that come up that they're aware of. And they also can develop uh, some good contacts and network, do some networking outside of your network of contacts uh, within doTERRA or, or the people that you know. That's a great insight. Wow. I love this. We, we don't typically go here, but this is a really good, really good conversation and really good things for us to be intentional about right now. Yeah. And you do need to sit down with your kids, though, to find out what their interests are. I mean, uh, if you think your child is, uh, you know, should be involved in the business, but they have no interest in it, well, then that probably, uh, you could at least explain what the positive things are about it and other things. But um, don't just assume that they're either, they either want to be in the business or they don't want to be in the business. You, just, you need to have open conversations, letting them know what opportunities might be available and what they can do. And, uh, and, you know, starting them on, on just small things that they can do and getting them uh, acquainted with the business. And also in network marketing, you know, it's something they could do part-time rather than full-time. And so maybe that's the direction that they want to go rather than to see it as a full-time career. It's something that they would do part-time. But you need to have conversation to let them know what the options are and here are the opportunities. And if you want to take advantage of these opportunities, here are the things that you need to be know, you need to know and do so that you can come and, and contribute. And hopefully it'll be a real positive thing for you. You'll like that opportunity. Okay, should I move on to talk about transition succession? Uh oh. Were we cut off? Okay. Okay, can you hear us now? Oh, I, I can hear you now. Here we go. We're here. I just couldn't unmute there. Yes, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> Take us there. I'm excited to. Okay. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about if you bring your children in. Um, you know, sh uh, there's a question about should you make them, uh, should they become owners and or partners with you, et cetera. Generally, I, I don't think that's a good idea unless you really see them as long-term contributors. And if they are, you know, that, that makes sense. Uh, I've just seen too many bad breakups related to that. Uh, an example is in the network marketing industry, uh, I had Shelly Gardner from Stampin' Up, one of the founders, she came and spoke to my class. And Shelly's built, I think sales were uh, 250 million. I can't believe people buy stamps in that volume, but I guess they do. But uh, anyway, she went into uh, in the business with her sister, but over time, they just couldn't work together, and so she worked out an agreement to buy her sister out. And I think it's worked out okay, but it created some hard feelings and issues. And so, you know, you don't want to have to – it's hard to predict. You, you don't always know. But uh, if you decide to go into partnership with, with your children, that's the one time – and I know I – denigrated lawyers a few minutes ago but no you get the lawyers involved mm -hmm. and you you know all partnerships will end at some point whether you either just disagree on something or decide not to be involved or somebody dies so make sure you set up a very clear partnership agreement you make sure you get a you do a buy sell agreement mm -hmm. okay particularly if somebody's you know you uh, if if some were, somebody were to die unexpectedly and uh, and you always have in terms of succession a contingency plan you know what if i 
you know, I'm running my business right now. What happens to it if I get hit by a bus today? Okay. You all should know exactly what's going to happen. Who's going to run it, how it's going to be managed, who's going to, where the assets going to go, all that sort of thing. And then you have a longer term plan, you know, 10, 20 years down the road. Okay. I'm going to finally retire. I want to get out of the business. And so what do I do about that? Um, and uh, and there you've got to think through, okay, so who do I turn both the ownership and the management of the business over to? And, and, uh, and that's a complicated issue. Or do I sell it? Or how does that work out? Do I turn it over to family? But you all in the short term should have a contingency plan and it's related to to your estate planning and the, a will that you have, uh, which too many people don't have wills. Um, uh, and the other thing that I find is I work with entrepreneurs who have their own business. Most of the studies that show that 50% of all entrepreneurs uh, have no plans to retire. So, which means that they're basically going to, I guess, drop dead while they're working. And, uh, and the problem with that is it doesn't allow the development of the next generation and it can create some estate tax problems, all kinds of issues. Um, so I would encourage you, even when you're young, when you have a business, you've got to make sure you're protected and make sure that you you know what will happen to your business make sure you've got life insurance or whatever it is that was part of either a buy sell agreement or to take care of your family where you pass away because unfortunately the unexpected all too often happens and uh you've got to be ready so i know that's a little bit of a downer but uh but that's just the way it is so make sure that you've got that in place the other thing is and I is that uh, in your in your in your will, make sure that you don't leave things to your kids that is assets or money before they're able to uh, handle it. A good example of that is a um, uh, a company called the Diet Centers, and it's not around now. But Sybil Ferguson was the founder. And she uh, she's related to me, and she came and gave a talk one time at BYU, and the title of her talk basically was The Curse of Wealth. And what happened is she started her business, these diet centers, with her husband, and then her lawyers told her, she said, they said, you need to, to uh, um, uh, give out stock to your kids because were you to die in a crash, there's a you know variety of tax implications, and so if your kids already have the stock, there's not going to be big estate taxes, et cetera. So she thought, okay, well that from tax standpoint that makes sense. Well, the problem. So she gave divided stock out to her children. I can't remember. She had five or six children, and then all of a sudden her business got in trouble, and she had to sell. So they sold the business and all of a sudden her kids, most of whom were teenagers or early twenties became millionaires overnight. And she basically said that this has created uh, a disincentive for her kids to work and to do things that were valuable to society. And it just created a, the next generation is, it's just just plain lazy and so she said you know i would never do that so if you do a, have a will or something set up and i did this with my children i uh, appointed an executor which would were i to die and my wife that uh, they would uh, manage my funds until my kids were 25 and then at age 25 they would then be able to get acts. They will be, they'd be able to get their inheritance. So everybody's a little bit different. Your situations is all, all different, 
but you've got to be careful about that just to make sure that uh, that uh, the children don't uh, get money before they uh, are, are ready to handle that. That's an unusual situation, but I have seen those kinds of things happen. Um, on that, so, on that note, yeah. um, I we have an ex, a, an estate planner that's helped us kind of put together some like a list of you know you do these ten things and then you can have access to um, what your parents have given you. What do you do? You recommend? On that level, uh, so what are the ten things? <laughs> I mean, yes. one of them is you know like eighteen. Like for us, it was do a service mission, um, complete some formal education. Um, it was all things that would help them develop as a person. Um, it was that kind of I think I I think that would make sense. Um, I'm not quite sure how that would get monitored, um, but age also isn't always the best thing because at 25, some people are very mature and some people aren't, and so that's a little hard to hard to know. Um, I guess as as long as the kids agree uh, and they, you don't make the barrier too high. For example, if you said you've got to do, you know, a service mis mission or whatever, and for some reason due to their situation that's impossible for them to do, then that obviously wouldn't make sense. For most people, it would be fine. Um, the main thing is they do have to be mature and they've got to see it as being, I think, uh, reasonable. So as long as that's the case, yeah, I, I guess I wouldn't have an issue about uh, identifying things that they would need to do. Uh, and I do know certain family businesses, um, like the Haas family at Levi Strauss, they said, uh, you know, you can't come to work in the business unless you have an MBA degree from Harvard. And and I thought about that, and I thought, well, they should at least have them go to a good school like BYU rather than Harvard. But, you know, that was what they decided, and that's wor that worked for them. So, so I'm okay. I, I think I'm okay with that as long as the is what you would ask them to do would would be reasonable and the kids would buy uh, buy into that the other thing is if by 16 they could do all of those things uh, maybe you don't want them at 16 to get the inheritance but but who knows everybody's different and at least in my family i've got some i've got seven children i've got six daughters and one son all of whom are really pretty responsible adult, adults and in fact we did have this thing at age 25, but when my youngest daughter turned 21, we decided she was responsible enough. So now we don't have an executor and we're my wife and they've all graduated from college. So we're my wife and I to pass away the, the, uh, my estate just goes directly to them. That's that's neat to hear. Um, one of our diamonds is saying in his estate plan they don't get anything except college and some living expenses until thirty five. Kind of like what was written in the Millionaire Next Door. Yeah, and I think that makes a lot of sense. I, I, I uh, the only thing I, the only thing that I do, and I and this is more of a personal thing, is that if my if my kids need money for like. Uh, a down payment on a house or things of that nature. Um, you know, if you wait till 35, that might be okay. But, you know, my kids have needed help a little bit earlier than that. And uh, the other thing though I do is I never loan my children money. Uh, I'll give it to them, but I've seen too many, and I'm not saying you shouldn't loan them money. And there may be situations where it makes sense and they, they could pay you back and other kinds of things. Tell but us how I've you seen, never loan them money. We want to hear. How you what? I don't loan them money? Right. Explain how you do that. Yeah. Oh, well, what I do, well, I give them, I will give them money. Okay. So, for example, um, uh, I had a daughter. I'll give, you, well, I'll give you a few examples. I had a daughter who wanted to get a master's degree in history. And 
So she needed money for tuition. I said, I'm not going to, and it wasn't that much, but I said, okay, um, we'll pay for, we'll, we'll, we'll pay for tuition. We, and so we just paid the tuition and we just gave her the money. I've had another, um, son who needed, uh, some help with a down payment on a house. And it was, that was a little bit more money, considerably more, but we said, and he's been responsible and he's got, uh, uh, well, he just had us, he had his sixth child yesterday and he's a professor and he's doing well. And, but you know, professors early on don't make all that much money. And so we just said, we're just going to give you the money. And, 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 uh, to, to help with your down payment. And I'm, and we tend to do things based on need rather than, well, let me, let me, let me back up a little bit. Typically in dealing with your children, you want to be fair. Okay. Fairness is a big issue. And there are three ways of thinking about fairness. One is you're fair if everything's equal. Okay. So in an inheritance, I give every buddy equal amount. A second way to think about fairness, it's based on merit. So I give more of my estate to people or to my children who have been helpful to me, who have uh, done things that have been positive, and so they deserve it. Uh, they deserve more because they're, they've done more. And a third way to think about fair, it's based on need. So uh, those who need help, so I've got a son-in-law who's doing very, very well. He probably doesn't need money, but we will, you know, tend his kids or do other things to help them. But others who have financial needs, then we provide them with more funds. Now, part of the question is, which of those three criteria should I use to be fair? And I think anybody can be different, but what I do is I tell my children that when I think about fairness, at least early on, I'm only gonna, I'm going to do it based on need, but once we die, the the estate is going to be divided up equally. So it's going to be based on not on merit. It's just going to be based on everybody should be equal. But that means early on, I'm going to help some kids a little bit more than others financially because of the situation that they find themselves in. So it's very it's it's very difficult at times to, to sort that out. But for me, uh, trying to be fair in treating my children, uh, equally is, is, is a, it's a difficult issue, but it's one that, that's, that, that is very important. And has that worked well with your children? Yeah, they, they, well, get they don't mind being given money. They don't <laughs> mind being given money. They don't have to be paid, pay it back. They're, they're they're happy with that, but, um, they don't get but mad I because one child was given more based on merit or need. Well, we don't. Yeah, we don't. We don't sort of publicize how much we're giving early on. They might talk, but they're all doing fairly well. So it's not like oh, there's you know somebody's you know living on the streets. They're all doing fairly well, but, but I've been up front and tell it, told them about, I tell them that's what we're doing and we're not going to loan, you know, I, every year I get all my children and their sit and their spouses together and we have a meeting. I review my will, Teresa and I, my wife and I, we review our will. We, they, they know exactly what's going to happen were we to die. We, uh, the certain heirlooms that we have, we've decided, you know, uh, who's going to get what, so they know what that's going to look like, and we've told them explicitly that we don't, well, we will not loan you money. We'll help you in different ways, which we have. Uh, I don't recommend co-signing on a loan, but I we have done that one time, and uh, where we my parent of oh, my parents where Teresa and I to die, um, that particular asset comes out of the. Uh, the estate of my one daughter. Mm -hmm. So, so, but we're really, we try to be transparent and in general transparency 
And so there's a culture of, oh, let me have, if I've got a question about something, we can talk about it and come up with, with, uh, uh, you know, with a solution. So uh, that's worked for us to be open, to be transparent, and to uh, to give money to help family when they need it. But uh, again, everybody's a little bit different. And so, like I say, my oldest daughter and son-in-law who are doing very well financially, for me to give them an extra 10, 20, whatever thousand dollars, that's not gonna be helpful to them. There's other ways we can be helpful to them. To my other son-in-law who's uh, starting a PhD program, you know, uh, providing some financial help for them, that does make sense. Or my son-in-law in uh, medical school. So, so everybody's a little bit different that way. Awesome. That's really good to know and good to hear. Maybe we can, <clears throat> um, let's see, open it up for some questions. Yeah, any, yep. Have you um, round out? What questions do you have? What are you wondering? Um, Dr. Dyer, he's, he's seen this happen on so many levels. He can guide here. Do you have something specific that you want to address? We've had some conversation on how to hire your children um, in the chat, and so that's been really healthy. Um, any, any oh, okay. let that. me let me do one let me do one other thing before I ask on yes. on your children in the business. Mm -hmm. If you can get a mentor who is, if you can get a mentor who is um, not family to also help mentor your children, that's pretty good. Because often you're so close to them, you can't be objective and be as helpful. So if you had, you know, say you're doing network marketing with doTERRA, if there, if there were another, uh, a, you know, a, a fellow distributor that could uh, take your child under their wing and help them, I think that's another good way of helping uh, your kids learn about the business. Maybe they listen listen a little better huh yes <laughs> okay all right so yeah uh but anyway i'm open to any other any questions you might have hi natalie can you hear me yes karina go ahead hi hi dr dyer thank you for joining us it's hi. really a great uh, call great information so i have a question it's kind of going in a different direction but i don't i'm wondering if there may be others my children are still still fairly young um but yeah. i'm actually in the process of really wanting to help my mother who is not prepared for even retirement, let alone ongoing yeah. needs. So I've been putting money away every month into a um, uh, retire, like an account for her, but I would just love your thoughts on that as well, and maybe some good ideas, some good practices, and maybe what to avoid. Yeah, does she know about that, that you're doing that to help she, her? She does, she does. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, I put I it into an account, Sorry, just really quick. I put it into yeah. a um, uh, life insurance policy where she'll be able to pull out, I think, 80 to 90%, but it won't in yeah. any way diminish her ability to receive things like Medicare and things that she will be eligible for. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, for, for parents, the, the, the key issue typically is, you know, long-term care. And if you have the ability to put either money away for them or to get a long-term care policy, although those are pretty pricey, um, you know, that's important. Uh, you're looking right now, and I've looked at it recently, you know, you're probably talking uh, for, for sort of average care, anywhere from at the low end two to $4,000 a month. And then, it, and then if you have, you know, a, a parent who has Alzheimer's or whatever, then it that can run you more than that. So, um, particularly uh, for parents, if you can, if you can, um, if you can do that for them, uh, I think that's great. And uh, uh, unfortunately, people just uh, due to circumstances or other things don't plan very well for the future. And uh, and as a country in the U.S., we're going to be in real trouble with 
a large number of baby boomers retiring without much savings. I don't know if any of you <clears throat> look at the statistics, but very few, uh, well, I'm not say very few, but actually a large percentage of baby boomers are not going to be able to uh, make it very well on Social Security and Medicare, those kinds of things. So uh, I think that's a great thing. If you can afford to do it, I would, um, I wholeheartedly support that because you want to take care of your parents. And if you, and, and you can be stuck with really significant bills if you don't uh, plan like you are uh, by putting away money early on. Uh, and the only thing I might suggest is if you could find a good long-term care policy. I know my in-laws had that. That was helpful. But if the life insurance policy that you got will take care of that. But again, you've got to sort of plan on at the the real cheap end to put them in care, maybe t at least in Utah, 2000 a month. But mostly you've got to plan on about 4000 and then it could be higher depending on uh, the the... Dr. The health of your of your parents, Doctor Dyer. Do you put any um, any stipulations on that, or is it just a gift back to those parents? Is it just a way of honor? that would be a gift? Mm -hmm. I would I would just do I would do it I would do it. What I would probably set it up. I like the life insurance uh, approach, mm -hmm. but uh, I would probably just put that money away and not let them have access to that mm -hmm. until you know they are in need of it and that you probably still are in control of that asset. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I say that is, uh, is and again, it depends on the, the situation, but I have seen cases where, you know, uh, elderly people are taken advantage of mm -hmm. or they, uh, you know, they start, experiencing some dementia and they'll start buying things that they shouldn't, um, you know, those kinds of things. So I, I'm a little concerned. I would be a little concerned that, that, uh, there should at least be at the very least, probably co-signing on the checks, et cetera, related to how to access those funds. Thank you. Good, good suggestions. We that's do good, have that. And that's a good question. That's a yeah. good question. In, in my case and in my, in my my parents' case, uh, they were both uh, my parents and my in-laws were. They had long-term care and other kinds of things, and they've all passed away now. But it certainly made it a lot easier for us because we didn't feel like we had a financial burden that we had to assume to take care of them. But there are lots of families that do, and they have to, and they have to, uh, you know. And, and I have great admiration for them to bring the parents into their home and take care of them. But that's really tough. That's a tough thing to do. Any, any other questions? Great question, Karina. Yeah. Anyone else? Are we, are we good? <laughs> Everybody's got other work to do today. I'm going to go play basketball. Go we all it. do. We all do. I'm so grateful for your insights here. One last um, question that I have is, okay. um, you know, we're trying to give our children little experiences now, right? So yeah. got a 17-year-old, 14-year-old, 11-year-old that we're like, okay, let's start giving them a little bit of experiences with money. Um, Jenny and Lyle talked about how, what if what if you had them read a few books and then gave them a gift of some money to take care of so they start learning some stewardship there. Um, so we're in the process of doing that. What do you think about, you know, you're talking about give now in some ways. What do you think about giving in that way uh, that kind of sets? I think that yes. – I I think that's okay. I think that's okay. In my situation, once my kids turned fifteen, they went and they went went out and got a job. They were I mean, these weren't great jobs. They're fast food or or I remember my son before his mission uh, did uh, worked in the cafeteria at the MTC and other kinds of things. So uh, I think I think that having they they. You know, setting up things to have them work. 
seven year old, you're not going to have them get a job. Mm -hmm. But I think too many kids today sometimes, uh, you know, don't know how to how to work very well, and so and and to work for an employer, not us. So um, and and to earn their own money and to kind of make their own way, and so. I, I think you're fine by doing that, but I'd encourage, particularly once they turn 15, they usually can get a, you know, a job is to, okay, now's your chance to go out and get a job. So um, I encourage them to do that. So that's that's been our approach. Uh, but if there are things where they can do some things where you can pay them on reading or things of that nature, um, I think that would be, uh, I think that would be fine. Okay, good, good insight. Get back to the, to the job piece. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, like, I like them to do that because they learn how to be responsible. They know how to show up. Too often if they work for mom and dad, or for mom and dad, we'll tend to cut them a little slack and whatever. And they also realize, they can realize that there are a lot of bad employers out there. So when they work, for you or whatever, they realize, oh, this isn't so bad, uh, and they learn uh, they learn what it's like out there. So, I like to get them out working and and uh, and working early. That's so that's a, if they're not too excited to work and help us in our DoTerra business, we get them out in the workplace, and then they'll get them appreciate absolutely. And then they, then they'll say, oh, maybe mom and dad <laughs> that their opportunity is not too bad. Yeah. yeah. So I. And, and if they do work for you in the business, you know, you do pay them like an employee, like you would anyone else. I mean, yeah. you set it up as an employment contract. Um, and, uh, and the time they put in, they should be compensated for. So I think that's important. Awesome. Love it. So grateful for your time today, Gib. Thank you for bringing okay. so much of your expertise in a way that it can bless our homes, our families, our businesses. So I know. I know I've been edified, so thank you so much. Well, good, good luck. And, you know, what you do um, and your group, I mean, that's the backbone of American, you know, enterprise. If we don't have folks like yourself who are entrepreneurial and out, to, you know, generating uh, wealth and income and jobs, uh, we're going to be in big trouble. So, anyway, thank you for what you're doing as well. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Have a great day. You too. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Okay. Thanks all you bye diamonds bye. that have joined us today. Um, great insights. I'm posting my top takeaways um, in the group chat as well as the Diamond Mastermind page. Um, so some great, great ideas on how to take things to the next level in our family business. Any last comments? Insights? We love you all. Have a rockin' day and an amazing month of August. Um, we're just getting ready for this incredible growth stretch. So um, July is a summer month. Remember that. Take a deep breath and let the growth begin because working up to convention and beyond is going to be amazing. And I think we'll know growth like we have never experienced it before talking with the executives and they've felt this and they know the pattern. Um, so make sure your people are prepared to be at convention. Do what it takes to help them be there so they can gain this experience, so it can become a part of them. Um, this has got me thinking I'm, I want to pull my older two out of school for a couple days so that they can experience convention and it can be real for them too in this way. And uh, I'm about, I'm going to send some kids out to get some jobs too. This is good. Um, so get those tickets out. Remember um, last month's call, if you missed that, we talked about um, giving a little bit more than you can and where we've invested in our doTERRA business and where it's made a big difference. And that $9,000 investment where we pulled from our home equity line of credit, I'm not recommending you all do that, but that to get people to convention was one of the best investments we've ever made in our business. So help people get there, whatever it takes, empower them that way. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, 
I can do this. <laughs> um, honey, how do I choose? Let's see. Go ahead. I gotcha. <laughs> thank you. I just really wanted to say thank you. Um, I had a team member in um, Atlanta that came to your uh, Inspire event. Yeah. And um, I, I wanted to let you know, like directly, she came back to me and called me afterwards. And I'm in California, so that was good with the timing because it was rather late and stuff. But she, um, she was like, because I went to that, I'm 100% going to convention. So I really wanted to say thank you. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. You it made a big bit of it. And she's bringing her husband and her two twin daughters. So. Oh, that's awesome. We are yeah. so grateful to hear that. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Need. Thank you. Thanks for getting her there so that we could do what we could do. And it's so great that we can all support in this way. Um, $49 husband bring along, right? With Emily Wright announced, I believe I'm, I've heard it through the grapevine, but I've been all over the place. And I think that's amazing. I think we should go back and hit our teams with that husband piece and get them to bring them along because it's life changing and they will both be partnered in this and be able to take it to the next level. So thank you for your gratitude. Grateful for all of you. Go bless the world. We love you.